the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father God, for this beautiful day you blessed us with, Lord. Thank you for the sunshine and the unseasonably warm weather. Thank you, God, for this chance to be in your house again, Lord, and be able to study your word together, God, and just grow in our walk with you, Lord. So thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to teach from your word. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you would just guide my tongue and say only what you would have me say, only what you would want me to say. And Lord, I pray your anointing fill this place, God, and be with those that are watching online as well, Lord. May they feel your anointing, God. Because it's so important, Lord, that we focus on you, God, that we put all other things aside and have some time just to share together um, with, from your word, God, and just let it speak to us and guide us and direct us in the way that we should go. And we do pray, Lord, for Israel and pray, God, just for peace there. We pray, Lord, for wisdom for their leaders. We pray, God, that Hamas and any, anyone else, Lord, that would uh, in, intend to, to do them hard, harm, Lord, will be thwarted in their efforts, God. We pray for protection, Lord, for all those that are there. Lord, we pray for the Christians that are there, God, that are doing their best to maintain order and peace and continue to lead people to you, Jesus, in this very difficult situation. Help them, God, to not get discouraged, to not give up, but to keep doing the best they can, God, to spread light in the darkness. And Lord, for those in Israel that do not know you, I pray, Jesus, that this would cause them to call out to you, Jesus, to cry out to you, Jesus, to realize that life can change quickly and that it will not always go the way that we want it to, Lord, but we can have hope in you, Jesus. We can have peace in you, Jesus. Even in the midst of a literal war, Lord, we know you can be with us and guide us and help us to get through these difficult times. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we will finish our series tonight on Saul. And I want to start with asking you how will you be remembered? So think about that tonight as we go through this study, as we finish this up. And I think from time to time, we should ask ourselves that question, not from a, a place of pride, as in, you know, we want people to think we were amazing or awesome or remember all these achievements or trophies or things that we accomplished, but from a place of honest reflection. How will we be remembered? How do we want to be Remember, we can all look back on decisions we made, things we wish we had done differently. If only I had went left instead of right. If only I had taken that new job opportunity when it was given to me instead of staying where I was. Uh, in, in my case, if Heather had said no to my marriage proposal, she would have missed out on all of this. I'm joking. Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. A godly wife is a good gift indeed. But in all seriousness, right, we make choices every day, some very simple, some could be life-changing, right, like a new job or moving to another state, something like that, or if we are getting married or not, things like that. So sometimes the choices we make impact those around us, right? I mean, something as simple as what you're having for dinner tonight, probably not going to change the world. But if you are a leader, for example, your choices are definitely making an impact in those in your care. And that can be good or bad. So whatever you say and do will draw attention to you, especially if you are a Christian. Do people even know you are a Christian? What are you doing to lead people to Jesus? Because we are all leaders in that sense, right? As Christians, it is up to all of us to lead people to Jesus with whatever gifts, talents, abilities the Lord has blessed us with. So how will you be remembered? Perhaps for a certain skill you possess, maybe for your kindness, your generosity, your sense of humor. I hope all of us will be remembered as people who loved Jesus and shared his love with others. I think that should be the goal of all of us, right? Is to be remembered as someone that truly loved Jesus, that exhibited that in our words and our actions. Yes, we're going to make mistakes, and people may remember those things about us as well, but hopefully, you know, when they recall our name, if the Lord calls us home before he returns, that's what they remember, you know, is how we showed the love of Christ to those in need, how we showed the love of Christ to those that were hurt and broken, how we showed the love of Christ to those that were in need. Hopefully how we showed humility and compassion, just like Jesus did as well. And the last verse we will read tonight is David remembering Saul. And David would hold Saul in high esteem, despite Saul's failings. And at the beginning of the series, I said we would look at both the good and bad that Saul did. And I have taught you only 
what the Bible says. But the sad thing is, as we will see tonight, right up until his death, Saul would continue to make bad choices. He would continue to just do things in the heat of the moment, you know, not without any prayer or guidance from the Lord, but just, you know, his emotion, his anger, his frustration, his jealousy rising and make these terrible, terrible choices that, as we will see, and as we have seen already so far, not only impacted him and affected him in a negative way, but affected negatively as well so many of the people in his uh, circle, if you will. So I remember Saul as someone who wasted his potential. He was given all the tools he needed for success, but his fear and his pride held him back. And I do not think I'm better than Saul. We are all sinners saved by grace, right? The Apostle Paul told, tells us that, wants us to remember that. None of us are better than anyone else. But to me, Saul is a sad and tragic figure, and that's one reason why I wanted to take a look at him for this current study, so we can learn from what he did wrong, not to poke fun or throw stones or think we are so much better, we have achieved so much more, but to be warned by that and see where he messed up so that hopefully we won't as well. Hopefully we won't make those same choices. Hopefully we won't make those same bad decisions. Because Saul's worst enemies were not the Philistines. His worst enemy was himself. He rejected God. That cost him everything, his kingdom, his family, his very sanity, right? As we began to see two weeks back, it cost him the peace that only God can provide. We saw that in our last study as well, that God had completely rejected Saul because Saul had first rejected him, and he no longer had God's guidance or God's peace in his life or God's direction or even God's protection, as we will see later on. So in our last study, Saul was descending into anger and paranoia. He tries to kill David because he's jealous of him. He sees him as a threat to his kingdom. The sad thing was that we know at this point the kingdom was not even his anymore to lose, right? God had made it clear that he had rejected Saul as king. Saul would live out his days as king, but once he died, that was it. it you know, the kingdom would pass to David. It would not even stay in Saul's family. But this is how delusional and just far from where he should have been mentally that Saul was, that he does not even realize anymore that it's not even his to give away. Truly, it wasn't his to give away to begin with. I mean, everything we have belongs to the Lord. All good things come from God. But God made it so clear on two occasions that he had rejected Saul as king, that he had regretted making Saul as king. And that is a sad place to be, knowing that God has rejected you, that God has, um, you know, abandoned you because you've made that choice, that you abandoned him first. So we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 18, starting in verse 28. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michal loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him, and he remained his enemy the rest of his days. So at this point, David has married Michal, and Saul arranged this marriage as a way to distract David. Saul thought having a wife would make David lose focus. So in theory, Saul is thinking, all right, well, David's attention is divided. He has, a, he has a wife now. He will die in battle. My enemy is gone. There you go. Problem solved. But if you look at verse 28 again, Saul realized that the Lord was with David. It was that obvious that the Lord was with David. And if the Lord is with you, then the only thing that can harm you is what the Lord allows. No man, no terrorist group, no disease can harm you unless God allows it. And this is what Saul failed to realize, right? It's sad because he realizes, wow, the God that was once with me has left me, but he's with David. It was that obvious that David walked in the steps of righteousness, right? But it's sad that Saul doesn't even try to get that back, that relationship that he once had with God. And also sad that he thinks he can somehow harm David, knowing that obviously the Lord is with him, and that at this point as well, it is made clear that David will be the next king of Israel. Now, David had to still use wisdom and common sense. David couldn't do some foolish action and just expect God to always save him. But again, he, what would happen to David is only what God would allow to happen to David. So Saul could have been working alongside David all this time, right? Getting him ready to take over as king, helping him to not make the same mistakes he did. It could have been an awesome transition, right? Saul could have given his farewell speech, right? Step down, say goodbye to, to his kingdom, let them know what he did right, what he did wrong, got his heart right with God. How awesome that would have been. But that is not how it went, we know already so far. Because again, Saul's pride and jealousy got in the way. In 1 Samuel 19, picking up in verse 8, 
Once more, war broke out. And David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spear from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. David pursued God. His relationship with God was strong. Because of that, he continues to prosper. And Saul rejected God. And because of that, he continues to spiral into depression and desperation. The relationship now between Saul and David is destroyed. And it is sad because it did not have to be that way, right? So again, these are you know, actions Saul took that didn't just affect him, it affected the people around him as well. Because remember, someone's recording all this, all these stories, and they're seeing this, and they're passing it on throughout the, throughout the palace and throughout the kingdom. Hey, our king just tried to kill his son-in-law, the captain of his guard. You know, David, the guy we all love? Yeah, our king just threw a spear at him. What would people think hearing that? They'd probably be a little concerned, I would think, right? So how sad that is. Because we know now David spends about 10 years on the run from Saul, with Saul trying to kill him every step of the way. And various people helped David along the way, including Saul's son, Jonathan. And David and Jonathan are best friends, and Jonathan being a godly man, he submits to David and even tells him, you know, you will be king. I submit to that. That is God's plan. I will be your second in command, and we will, we will rule together. And how awesome that would have been. And Jonathan, as we saw already in previous studies, and we see here again, had much greater spiritual maturity, sadly, than his own father. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, picking up in verse 30, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. Saul is so angry, he cursed out his own son in front of a group of people. And what we just read in verse 30 is the cleaned up version. <laughs> in the original Hebrew, what Saul said to Jonathan is actually much worse. So this happened during, we know, during the new moon feast. So it's Saul and Jonathan, his son, and all his important officials, all his leaders, they're all there. They all have just seen and heard the king screaming, you know, murderous obscenities to his own son. What a terrible way to be remembered. Because again, someone's recording all this. Someone's writing it all down. Someone's saving it for posterity, right? And in the day and age we live in, you can barely say anything while someone recording it and putting it on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram or whatever. So be careful what you say and what you do because people are, are watching. And I said that to myself as well, believe me. Before I ever come up here, I am with God myself, making sure I am in the right. And then and I'm asking God for forgiveness for anything I need to get right in my own life. So it's never me standing here and judging others. I'm saying is, as a family of God, we all need to be careful what we say and what we do because people are watching, people are listening, people are recording it. And again, when you were a leader, such as Saul was, people are really paying attention, right? Because if the king, the queen, the president, the prime minister are doing something, then many of the people in their care are going to figure, well, that's okay. Saul was angry, so he wanted to kill his enemy. Why can't I do that? And on and on it goes. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, picking up in verse 32. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. On that second day of the feast, he did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. So Saul has a spear. You know what that means. Someone's about to die or he's going to throw it at someone. So no sooner has he just screamed these terrible things to his own son, and not just that, but the embarrassment of it as well, right? All the important officials of Israel are there and see this and hear this. But now he actually tries to kill his own son. How far into just madness and anger and jealousy does a man have to sink that he's willing to kill his own flesh and blood. I hope that's a place that none of us ever 
get to or, or, every, or even really can understand. You know, when I was a teenager, my dad and I had some, some screaming matches for sure, but I was never in fear of my life. My father never cursed me out or called me obscenities. You know, I, I just can't imagine a relationship like that between a father and son or a mother and daughter or any kind of f- familiar relationship. How sad that is that this man, Saul, that was once anointed by God, you know, through the prophet Samuel, has sunk so far into just desperation and paranoia. So we all make choices, some good, some bad. And Saul's bad choices are no longer just impacting him. They are impacting everyone around him. He has destroyed his relationship with God, first and most important. He destroyed his relationship with Samuel, David, and now his own son, Jonathan, as well. Think carefully about the choices that you make. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, picking up in verse 6, Now Saul heard that David and his men had been discovered, and Saul was seated, spear in hand, under the, under the tamarisk tree on the hill at Gibeah, with all his officials standing at his side. He said to them, Listen, men of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make all of, your, all of you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Is that why you have all conspired against me? No one tells me, well, my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is concerned about me or tells me that my son has incited my servant to lie in wait for me, as he does today. And Saul is a grown man, but he's acting like a child here. Everyone is against me. No one tells me anything. No one keeps me in the loop. No one is concerned about me. Wah, 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 right? Saul's biggest concern is himself. Hey, Saul, remember God? He's supposed to be our biggest concern. He is supposed to be number one priority in our life, is our relationship with God. It's God first, Saul, and then it's your kingdom, and then it's everything else, or whatever your job, occupation may be, or whatever you may be leader of. It's God first, and then everything else. Even our family has to come after the Lord. Our relationship with God has to take precedence over everything. Now, we don't ignore our family and our friends. I'm not saying that. But what's most important is in our life is our relationship with God. Because if that is not sound and strong, we're not going to be any good to anybody else anyway. So that has to take priority in our life is our relationship, our love for the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, picking up in verse 9, But Doeg the Edomite, who was standing with Saul's officials, said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Ahimelech, son of Atob, at Nob. Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions and the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. No one likes a tattletale. That's what Doeg the Edomite is. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to paraphrase a few things. Back in chapter 21, and I encourage you to read that through for yourself. While David is on the run, he goes to meet with Ahimelech the priest. David lies to Ahimelech. Bad choice for sure, right? We're going to call it out when we see it. We're not just picking on Saul. David tells Ahimelech he is there on business for the king. Ahimelech has no idea what's going on, does not realize that Saul at this point is trying to kill David, and unfortunately is just caught up in this terrible situation. So Ahimelech is completely innocent. But unfortunately for everyone, there was also a villain there, as we just read. Doeg, who was Saul's chief shepherd. And picking up in 1 Samuel 22, verse 13, Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and acquiring of God for him, so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me as he does today. Ahimelech answered the king, who of all your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard and highly respected in your household? Was that day the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. But the king said, you will surely die, Ahimelech, you and your whole family. Then the king ordered the guards at his side, turn and kill the priest of the Lord, because they too have sided with David. They knew he was fleeing, yet they did not tell me. But the king's officials were unwilling to raise a hand to strike the priest of the Lord. 
So Ahimelech did nothing wrong. As I just said, he is completely innocent in this. He even defends David, right? He shows great bravery in this situation, knowing it's probably going to cost him his life because if he did not know before what was going on, he knows now. And he can see the anger and the frustration in Saul's eyes and realize, wow, this is not the king that I once, I once remember. My life is probably on the line. But he takes a stand for David anyway, right? In his final moments, he does a good thing, as all godly people should. But Saul, blinded by his rage, orders his men to kill these godly priests. So Saul still has many loyal subjects. We know that even after his death, there would be war between the house of Saul and David for a while before David would finally take over the kingdom. But even Saul's men refused to do this. This is a bridge even they will not cross. To their credit, even they will not strike down men of God. So Saul's terrible way of thinking did not happen overnight. This is a warning for all of us, right? One bad choice can lead to another, can lead to another, and before we know it, we could be doing these terrible things as well. One bad choice, like a snowball, right? It gets bigger and bigger until finally it's an avalanche, and it can lead to our destruction. And I think, again, reflecting on ourselves and how we, how we will be remembered, how we lived our life, it is never unwise to say, you know what, if I took the wrong path over and over and over, I could end up doing something like that. Because all of us, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, right? So I hope, and I don't think anyone that I personally know is capable of doing this, but all of us are capable of sinning. And if we continue down a life of sin and evil and rejecting God, there's no telling what terrible things we might do. So let us embrace God. Let us let the Holy Spirit speak to us and convict us before it's too late because Saul is at a place now of no return, sadly. There is no indication at all that he's ever sorry or repentant. He just continues to spiral down into destruction and madness, and it's just destroying all these lives and people around him. And also, I've always wondered as well, I mean, he's on this run, you know, to try to kill David. What's happening to the kingdom in the meantime, right? The king's here with the army, and he's spending all these time, all these resources. I can't imagine the kingdom itself was in a great shape right now, especially when people here, you know, they go to, go to talk to their king. They need guidance or advice. Where's the king at? Oh, he's spending even more time trying to kill David, you know, his son-in-law, the one that we so highly respect. So again, we make bad choices. It's rarely just affecting us. More often than not, it's affecting people around us as well, whether we realize it or not. And it's certainly always affecting us because no one might know the terrible choices you're making, but God knows. God always sees what we're doing, what we're thinking, what we're plotting, what we're scheming. We're never hiding anything from him. So let's get our lives right with God if they're not and make the best choices we can possibly make with the Lord's help. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, picking up in verse 18, the king then ordered Doeg, you turn and strike down the priest. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He also put to, to the sword Nob the town of the priest with its men and women, its children and infants, and its cattle, donkeys, and sheep. How many innocent people were slaughtered that day because of one man's rage? 85 priests plus their families alone, right? What are we at now? Over 100, I'm sure. And after that, an enti the remainder of an entire town of innocent people. Do you see what one bad choice can lead to, can lead to, can lead to? If you were here for the beginning of this, of this series, we have seen Saul make many bad choices along the way. And in the beginning, they were things that really only were affecting him, right? They were affecting his relationship with God, which is terrible for sure. But because he continued down that path, now we see, wow, they're not just affecting him. He's destroyed all these relationships along the way. He's called for the execution of probably hundreds of innocent people now, all because he's angry, he's jealous, he can't let this go, he can't accept that God has rejected him, but because he rejected God first. So Saul is determined to just kill anyone in his way. There is no restitution. There is no talking it out, no working it out. If only he was that passionate about his relationship with God, he would not be in this mess to begin with. In 1 Samuel chapter 23, starting in verse 1, when David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Kila and are looting the threshing floors, he inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? 
The Lord answered him, go attack the Philistines and save Kilah. And this is just one of many examples that the Bible gives us where David inquired of the Lord. I like how it says that, inquired of the Lord, right? So he asked God what to do. He waited for God to speak to him and tell him what to do, right? Because we can ask God all day long for advice and guidance, but are we giving God time to speak? Are we giving God time to respond? I mean, God can respond obviously as quick as we ask, but sometimes God purposely makes us wait because he's testing our faith or he wants us to develop patience, right? God is not a magic genie here to grant our wishes. God is our heavenly father. And if God's not responding right away, then there's a reason. Wait, wait on the Lord. Now I understand there may be a life or death situation where you can't wait. You gotta do, just do what you think is right. And you do that with, with the best ability you have in the Lord. But when there are times that you know it's a situation you can wait on, you have time, then wait. What are you going to lose by waiting on God? Nothing, right? Maybe God's not responding because he's got even something better for you and he wants you to wait and realize that. Or maybe God's just trying to teach you something. Maybe there's some sin in your life you need to deal with first. And that's why God's not responding. But again, as well, if you remember, the few times we've actually seen Saul call on God, God did not respond. And Saul got angry and just went off and did his own thing. And again, we see this pattern, right, of Saul just getting angry. God's not listening to me. I'm going to do whatever I want. And what does David do? And again, I encourage you, read through all of 1 Samuel and see many times David inquires of the Lord. He waits for the Lord. He waits for God to tell him what to do. In 1 Samuel chapter 26, picking up in verse 21. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have been terribly wrong. Here is the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards everyone for their righteousness and faithfulness. The the Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I value your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. Then Saul said to David, may you be blessed, David, my son. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. So previous to this, David had an opportunity to kill Saul and he doesn't. He purposely stays his hand, right? Now David has had a second chance to kill Saul. Now think about it again. David's been on the run for almost 10 years at this point. He has, the Bible mentions about 500 people, possibly more at this point with him that have gathered around him, that have left Saul, that are just, you know, hurt and confused. They're in debt to the king. They have nowhere else to go. So it's not just him, right? It's his wives, his children. It's these hundreds of people that are all depending on David. And this is what he thinks. It can't get any worse or more confusing. He has two opportunities to kill his enemy. Again, I encourage you, read the verses previous to this in 1 Samuel 26. One of David's men even, uh, even volunteers to kill Saul for him. How tempting that would be in that moment, right? David could say, could say to himself, I don't have to get my hands dirty. No one, no one will even know except me and, and, and my right-hand man here. I can walk away from this. I can go home. Saul is dead. Everything will be great and fine and dandy. But David shows the patience that Saul never did. And he tells his soldier, no, we will not do that because he is still the Lord's anointed. What incredible respect David shows. David is proving himself to be a much better man than Saul ever was. And the the reason David holds, holds back is because he respects Saul's position, right? Saul was anointed by God. David takes that seriously. David is no fool, though. He knows Saul has lost his mind. So when they were having this exchange, David is far away from Saul. God gives us the ability to forgive, but God also gives us common sense. So that is why David kept his distance there of talking far apart. And sadly, this will be the last time they will talk, right? So they have a a sort of uh, reconnecting, if you will, but of course, nothing is ever the same after this. And again, it is sad that it got to this point, right? Ten years of just on the run of wasted time and wasted material and just so much destruction and death along the way. It didn't have to be like that, but because of one man making bad 
choices. So think about, again, we could easily fall into that trap, right? We make one bad choice here and one bad choice there. We, we compromise a little bit of sin there. Then we compromise some more sin. And before we know, we could be doing things we never thought we would do either. So Saul says some pleasing things here to David. And he does, to his credit, stop pursuing David after this point but he had not really changed. As we will see in the verses that come, sadly, Saul, again, is just saying what he thinks is the right thing at the time. But again, as we will see in just a few minutes here, um, he just continues to just fly off the handle, do things in the heat of the moment. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, starting in verse 3, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and the spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunuman, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There was one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. So at some point, Saul did something good. He expelled all the mediums, all the spiritists from Israel. So medium, fortune teller, whatever you want to call them, they are evil. They should not be pursued by God's people. Do not depend on a person to guide your future. It is God that directs our path. It is God that gives us guidance and wisdom and hope. Trust in God, not in psychic Susan. So God is not responding to Saul because his motive is impure, right? Remember, God already knows what we're going to do, what we're thinking before we even know what we're thinking or what we're going to do. And again, what does Saul do? Well, God's not responding, so you know what? I'll just go find some demonic medium somewhere, and, and she can tell me what to do. So we see Saul really didn't change at all, right? He's, he tells David in the moment, you know, some, some pleasant things, and maybe he's sorry that he pursued David, but there's no real repentance there. We're, we're given no indication that Saul ever, you know, repented before God. The only time we ever see God, uh, Saul ask God for anything is when he wants something, right? So, you know, he's God the Father. He's not here to just give us whatever we want and send us on our way. God deserves our praise. God deserves our gratefulness. Of course, we can go to God with our needs and even with our requests, but we have to do it from a place of humility. We have to do it from a place of saying, all right, the Lord's not responding right now. I will go back and do something else in the meantime. I won't go find some priestess of Satan to tell me what I should do. And if you look at verse 8 again, Saul is in disguise. <laughs> if you have to hide what you're doing, you probably should not be doing it. And that should have been a warning for Saul as well. But unfortunately, his mind is so corrupt and full of fear and paranoia at this point. He's not thinking clearly, and his heart is so hardened, he's certainly not hearing from God anymore, even after inquiring of God. That's why he's not hearing from God, because God's not going to respond to someone when he already knows their motives are impure. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, picking up in verse 9, but the woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like, he asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. This is indeed one of the strangest stories in the Bible, and opinions vary greatly on what happened here. So I will give you my opinion, but I encourage you with all of our studies, uh, always study this for yourself. Let the Lord speak to you. Study this on your own. See what you come up with. Um, so this is just my opinion, my take on this. So I would say without a doubt, most mediums, psychics, 
fortune tellers are frauds for sure. Some of them very clever, right? They're good at reading body language. They, they call it a cold reading. They, they just start spouting out various letters, numbers, words, and they can see how you're reacting. And that's their cold reading. They, they, they know nothing about you. It's called a cold reading. And they're able to start pulling facts out of you and pretending like they have some kind of power. Some of them are very good with sleight of hand, special effects. I mean, some of them are very clever. It's sad they're putting so much effort into deceiving people. If only they would use that ability for something good. The legendary magician, escape artist, Harry Houdini, he made a whole second career out of exposing fake mediums and spiritists because this was right after World War I, and there was this huge uptake in spiritists and mediums. Everyone, everyone wanted to talk to their loved ones that died in the war, and more and more people were getting taken advantage of. So Harry Houdini, using his magician's background, would go to these seances and you know, meet up with these fortune tellers and psychics and expose them for the frauds they were because he was angry that people were being taken advantage of. But there is a flip side to this for sure. Satan absolutely has power. Evil, demonic power, but power nonetheless. Now, it will always fall short of God. We know that. The Bible is clear on that. But Satan does have supernatural abilities, no doubt about that. The Bible makes that clear as well. We know demons are real. We know they have power as well. And there are absolutely people in this world who have embraced the occult, who have embraced things of a demonic nature. And they may even be able to demonstrate things that are not of this world. But there is a limit to what they can do. And again, the Bible warns us of this, especially in Revelation, right? In the last days, people will be performing all kinds of signs and wonders, but they are not of God. So there's a limit to what they can do. For example, predicting the future and knowing the future are two very different things, right? I can predict the future all day long, and so can Psychic Susan and, and uh, you, know, you know, Wanda the Wizard, right? Predicting the future and knowing the future are not the same things, all right? A stockbroker predicts the future. He tells his clients what to invest in based on how the market's going to go, things like that. We're in football season right now. You turn on ESPN any day of the week right now, commentators are on there predicting who is going to win Thursday or Sunday's game. That, that is not knowing the future, right? So this, again, this is how a lot of these con artists sucker people because they can predict whatever they want. You're going to meet a tall, dark stranger in two days from now and he'll buy you coffee. I can say the same thing and charge you $25.99 online, right? Only God knows the future. That is the difference, right? And this is why we need to be careful and make sure that we are trusting in the Lord for our guidance, for our hope, because no person, no demonic being is knowing the future. Again, they can manifest signs and wonders. We know that. And that's why we have to be careful and prayed up and being led by the Holy Spirit so we can expose these things when we see it but realizing that no good is going to come out of pursuing demonic things. Yes, we all probably are tempted from time to time, you know, have a, a shortcut, if you will, right? If only, oh man, I knew what was gonna happen tomorrow, I could plan this or I could plan that. But God doesn't let us know everything that's gonna happen at once because if we knew everything that was coming, we'd probably stay in our bed, pull the sheets over our head and never come out. But God wants us to have faith, to go out there, do what we need to do, to trust in him, to experience tough times every once in a while so we'll grow in our walk with him, so we'll grow in our faith in him. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, picking up in verse 15, Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul, so the Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams, so I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, why do you consult me, now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord, the Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be me with, with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. So this is not just a prediction. We're going to read these verses in just a few seconds. This is literally what happens. So because of all that and knowing that Samuel was a prophet of God, I believe that this actually is Samuel's spirit. Now, Psychic Susan or Madame Tussaud or whatever her name is did not bring Samuel's spirit up. 
if, if that is even indeed what this is. But the fact that this thing appearing to be Samuel knows the future, only God can knows the future, and it comes true, I, it's my opinion that God allowed Samuel's spirit to come back for this one last time, acting in the way of a prophet and telling Saul what his final fate would be. Because just as it is said here in these verses, as we will see, all these things do come to pass, just like it was said. But again, how sad that it's gone this far, right? Saul, remember, if you remember way back when we first started this series, right, we were told Saul was, you know, embraced by the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord was upon Saul, and he went to battle, and he saved Israel from their enemies, and he started out so good, right? He was so on passion, so so on fire for God, but he lost it just as quickly, and now he's killing men of God. He's hunting down other godly people. He's wasting all this time, all this money, all this effort. He's consulting with mediums, the very people that God told him to expel from the land. How far, or how sad it is, how far that he has fallen. In 1 Samuel chapter 31, starting in verse 1, now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell dead on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons at Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchi Shua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and his, all his men died together that same day. What a sad end to the king of Israel. Samuel, or I'm sorry, Saul, through Samuel, was anointed by God. That was not something to take lightly. God himself chose Saul to be king, right? We read that way back when. And how does Saul end? By taking his own life. We're given no indication that Saul was sorry or repentant or that in his final moments he prayed to God. Maybe he did. I hope that he did. But we have seen this before, right? So many times. Even in death, what is Saul most worried about? How he will look to other people. His sons are dead. His line is ended. His kingdom is coming to an end. His entire army is falling before him. And what what is he worried about? What people will do to his corpse? How sad that is. That was his biggest concern. Not God, not his family, not all the people back, you know, back where the palace was and and all the people living in, in, in the cities around there in Jerusalem who would protect them now, who would take care of them. He's not considered concerned about any of that and how sad that is. And finally, 2 Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 27. This is David speaking. How the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. And David writes his long lament for Saul and Jonathan, and he even makes the people learn it as well, the Bible tells us. So David did not gloat in his enemy's death. He's not happy about this. He's not rejoicing about it. He's mournful because a muddy man has fallen. And Saul did not die a hero for sure, but he was muddy in life. He started out good. He was muddy in that sense. But sadly, for the most part, he used his might for selfish gain, for selfish purposes, because might isn't necessarily a good thing, right? COVID was a muddy, destructive thing, right? The Nazi army was a muddy, destructive thing. Might, unfortunately, is not always a good thing, right? It's up to us as individuals to decide how we're going to use the abilities, the talents, that God has given us. And Saul apparently had the ability to rally troops, right? Even, again, as, as crazy as he was getting, we know even after his death, there were still people loyal to him, loyal to his family. So God blessed him with the ability to lead. He had this charisma to order people, to get them to do things. If only he had used that for good. If only he had used that, you know, to pursue God with all that he had. What a different story we will be reading right now. So Saul could have achieved so much, but he was focused on the wrong things. So how will you be remembered? As a hero? As a villain? Hopefully we will all be remembered as people that loved God. Let us pray. Thank you, Father God, again for this chance to just be able to study your word together. And God, I pray you help us to look or to uh, remember what we looked at tonight, tonight God. And you will help us, God, to understand it. Help us, God, to be able to apply it to our lives. 
And God, give us opportunities to share these good things with others as well, Lord. Not because I have taught it, God, but because it is your sacred word, Lord. And it has the ability, God, to change us, to convict us, to encourage us. So God, give us opportunities to share that with others. And God, when we are tempted to take a shortcut, when we are tempted to do something we know we shouldn't do because we are afraid or we are frustrated or angry, God, help us to just trust in you, to be willing to wait on you. God, help us to be like David and be willing to inquire of you, God, in all decisions that we are unsure of. God, help us to be patient like David, be willing to wait for you to respond. And help us, God, to be most concerned about our relationship with you, God, and not how we are viewed to, to others or even how we will be remembered, God, but that we are doing our best, Jesus, to lead people to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you Sunday morning. Next Wednesday is our night of prayer and worship, so I hope you can be here for that.